Well, brothers and sisters, this morning we are kind of wrapping up our series on stress, anxiety, and distress uh, with our, our, our final message, which is uh, the only fear worth having. The only fear worth having. We, we've spent, um, this will be the part four, we've spent a, a bit of time. There's lots more that can be said about uh, stress and fear and anxiety. And, and we want to remind you, like we talked about last week, that we are a congregation that uh, embraces the reality that our mental and emotional and spiritual and physical health are all uh, very, very important. And, you know, that struggling with our hearts, with our minds, is not shameful. It is not, um, it is certainly not uncommon. Um, and to that end, we, we support uh, and are part of the Congregational Assistance Plan. And so if you struggle with worry, um, there is the opportunity for you to go in and check in with uh, with a counselor, even if uh, even if your uh, psychiatrist or counselor, your your um, your health worker, your mental health worker, even if they say to you, "Hey, you know what? These are reasonable things to be worried about. <laughs> Let's teach you some coping strategies." Even if that's all uh, that that happens, that's great. That's fantastic. And so um, there are pamphlets available in the fellowship hall for. Uh, more information about the Congregational Assistance Plan and how you can receive uh, free, uh, qualified Christian therapy um, <clears throat> for, uh, for yourself, even if it's just a check-in or a check-up. Um, but that being said, um, there, yeah, like I said, there is a lot that could be talked about with regards to mental and emotional health, and particularly with regards to to worry. We have already talked about some very simple things that you and I can do to help alleviate some of our worries, uh, one being breath prayers. This practice, breath prayers, reminds us both that we are constantly in the presence of God, that there's no such thing as private alone space, even in our hearts and minds. And it also, at the same time, enables us to practice regularly, constantly, as often as we breathe, the practice of giving those worries over to God. Right? This is where you breathe in, which hopefully you do relatively frequently, and say something like, Lord Jesus, please. And as you breathe out, you say something like, have mercy on me, or have mercy on us. It's very simple. Breathe in, pray. Breathe out, pray. It doesn't have to be out loud. It can be just in your head. It can be quietly under your breath. You can choose a different phrase, a, a, a short Bible verse from your devotions, whatever you choose to do. And it's certainly not something you need to beat yourself up about, but it is one way to do what Paul says and pray without ceasing. And it is also one way to help lay those worries before God. And it is one way to help remind us that we are constantly in His presence and that He ultimately has control over our lives. We reminded ourselves also <clears throat> of the reality that we belong to God. We, we looked at the Heidelberg Catechism question and answer one and, and reminded ourselves that our comfort lies in the reality that we belong in our life and in our death, body and soul, to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And we, we looked at how Jesus said to us that, there is, that we belong to him and no one can snatch us out of his hand. That we are forever his. And not only that, we looked at the reality that he numbers the very hairs on our head. And that not even a sparrow can fall without the will of the Father in heaven. And yet we are worth so much more than sparrows. 
And so we reminded ourselves of those things. This morning we want to look at how there is there is one fear worth having because last week we specifically talked about the extremes to which this fearlessness that we are called goes. That when David in Psalm 27 talked about how even if an army laid siege to him, he would not fear, that that too applies for us. That no matter what we face in our lives, no matter how terrible it might seem, we really have nothing to fear from those things. With, which leads us back to, well, if we do not fear any of those things, any of those things that could happen to us, is there anything that we should properly fear. And so I would invite you, if you would like to pull out your pew Bibles or to follow along on the overhead as we look at Philippians chapter 2 verses 12. And I told David that we were going to look at verses 12 to 13 and we are, but I'm going to read a little bit further than that. I'm going to read to the end of verse 18 as well, just for that further context. <clears throat> so in this letter, Paul, writing to the church at Philippi, to the Christians there in Philippi, um, Paul talks in chapter, the beginning of chapter 2 about how they need, to, uh, they need to imitate Christ's humility. And then in verse 12, <clears throat> after he has encouraged them to imitate Christ's humility, he says these words. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, and not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And that is obviously our key phrase there. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For... Paul continues, it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your face, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. The word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I want to shine like a star in the heavens. Oh man, do I ever want that. Sometimes I think I want that a little uh, unhealthily, a little bit too much because I am unsatisfied with anything less. And that kind of leads to some pretty negative perfectionism and ugh, some yuck. That being said, who doesn't want to shine like stars in the heavens? What a picture. What a beauty. What an awesome thing. What an incredible thing. The reality is that stars are awesome things. Now, none of us get, you know, particularly close to, you know, stars. We don't 
come physically any closer than the closest our planet gets to our own star. At least, I don't think any of you have taken journeys through space towards a sun. Um, but they are awesome things. But there are also awesome things in this world. Things that are jaw-dropping. Things that make our eyes pop out of our heads. Things that maybe make us quiet with a sort of reverence. And I want you to think of those things for a moment because the reality is is that we live in a world that often feels mundane. It feels day-to-day and boring and ho-hum. So think for a moment of the things that you have seen (coughs) that were awe-inspiring to you. For me, the mountains in British Columbia, absolutely. That, that first time when you're, when you're driving through the prairies and you start to see in the blue, misty distance the rolling hills that lead up to the mountains, the foothills, and you know that it is coming and you get closer and finally you think, you think that there are clouds off in the distance because they are so high and they are so unclear. But then as you get closer, you see that they are not clouds way up in the skies, but they are mountains with snow covering them. And as you start to drive closer and closer, going through those rolling hills, (coughs) and then you get to the foot of the first mountain, and you look up and up and up. And it's only the beginning. Because after that are mountain upon mountain upon mountain, taller and taller And you start winding your way up the mountains, going through tunnels that are, you know, avalanche shelters, and seeing mountain goats on the side of the hills, climbing where I could never climb. And the trees get shorter and shorter until they stop altogether, because the trees can't even make it. And then it's like... It's 20 degrees on a summer day and you stop, you pull over the car and you start having a snowball fight at the top of the mountain because you can. Awesome. What have you seen? Either man-made or created by God. What have you seen that makes your jaw drop? That gives you awe. Honest question. The fall colors. The fall colors. Oh, yeah. Sometimes they're just absolutely incredible. Um, if you can get up on, on a hill. Oh, what's that place down um, Highway 15? Rock Dunder, right? If you can get there. Uh, hey. I forgot. Don't mock me. (laughs) It's true. It's beautiful, isn't it? Right? You get to the top there and you can look out over a sea of beautiful fall colors. It is absolutely awesome. Somebody else said something else. The Grand Canyon. You've seen the Grand Canyon? Oh, that would be so cool. Yeah. Was, Was it like a kind of like a a surprise, like sort of you go and then all of a sudden you can see it spread out in front of you? Yeah? Yeah? That would be quite something, right? Like, you know, just sort of level-ish ground and then all of a sudden, wow. Anybody else? The Great Smoky Mountains. Yeah. Yeah, I love that too. It's so good. It's beautiful. Uh, More trees going feels like higher up, but yeah, beautiful, yeah. Anybody else? Years ago, there was a photo of a baby reaching out of the uterus during surgery to grasp the surgeon's hand. 
Oh, my word. About how we were born looking for someone to hold us and for us to hold. Oh, yeah. I remember that photo vividly. So incredible. This tiny, tiny hand reaching out during in utero surgery to grab the finger of the surgeon. Oh, wow. Willie. Yeah, Niagara Falls. I could do without the, the touristy, casino-y, whatever the heck. I can do without that quite a bit. But that water thundering down, you can feel it in your bones. It's so much water. And it's just, oh, wow. Yeah. Anybody else? Beverly Lake? Beverly Lake? Yeah? I, hey, I have that over Lake Canadarego, which is a little lake in the New York, uh, upper New York state, uh, the, the Finger Lakes sort of region. It's not one of the Finger Lakes, but it's in that area. And my grandparents had a cottage and that thing, you know, just the changingness of the water and the waves and sometimes waking up in the morning and it is still and calm. It's like a mirror and the mist rolling over and then getting out in a sailboat and just feeling the wind and the, and, the, and the changing of the weather as the storm comes up over the hills on the other side of the lake. And it, if you're not careful, you get caught in it. And, oh, is that something like what you're thinking about? Kind of. Is there anything in particular that Beverly Lake fits for you? The beach. Okay. Neat. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Anyone else? Sunsets. Yeah. Sunsets. Yeah. Amen, sister. Yeah. Sunsets are incredible. We get some gorgeous sunsets here. Absolutely amazing. Wendy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember camping in the pineries um, in, in southwestern Ontario growing up and just, oh, just the, the I mean, the pine trees. Whew. But then also the, the, the beaches and the sand dunes and just incredible. Uh, Aaron, I think Aaron and I were listening on the radio and we were hearing about in, in California how they were trying to protect the uh, the giant redwoods, the sequoias, and how there is one called Old... General Sherman. Oh yeah, General Sherman. And this tree, they figured, is somewhere north of 2,000 years old. And it was... It's, it's about 10 stories high or something like this. Absolutely incredible. And they are trying to do their best because of all the terrible wildfires to protect these trees. Um, but just, I remember there was, we had a Thunderbird, a nice big red Thunderbird. And we went there once um, to the Redwoods. And um, there was a tree that had a tunnel carved through it big enough that we could drive that old Thunderbird through the trunk of the tree. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. But we so easily lose that awe and we find it hard to gain back the sort of reverence that we ought to have. See, all of these things that you have just mentioned that we have talked about are things that point to the one for whom we ought to have a proper fear. And by fear here, when Paul is writing, Paul is not writing fear as in, uh-oh, I'm afraid that God will smite me kind of fear. 
That's not what he's saying when he says work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He does not mean do good or the bad, nasty God the Father will come and lay you down with thunder and lightning. That's not the message that is going on here. But instead, the message that is going on here is that <clears throat> we ought to have fear and trembling, we ought to have reverence and awe for our God and the fact that that God is in relationship with us. If you were to be able to travel throughout space and time or whatever, there is a, a thing, a theoretical idea <coughs> out there about how it would be possible to build something called a Dyson sphere. A Dyson sphere is a really cool thing. A Dyson sphere is not a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> but Instead, it is the idea of building a shell around a star such that you could live on the inner surface of that shell. So it would be built out to approximately the diameter of, for example, the Earth's orbit from the sun. And you would have to build that thing to enclose the whole star. Can you imagine a construction that existed that wrapped around an entire star? Can you imagine how much surface area you would have to live on? How huge that would be? Or think about the real idea of infinity. This idea that numbers go on forever and there is nothing, there is no way to reach the end of numbers. But brothers and sisters... Not only does all of that point to the God who creates and sustains everything, but there is also awe and wonder all around us in the everyday that points in the same direction. You, for example, are not mundane. What does the Bible, what does David say about how he is made? I praise you, God, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I may see you, you may see you every day of the week, but that should not help us, or that should not make us Consider each other to be mundane. We are works of art. We are beautiful. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. When I see you, when you see you, when you see me, we ought to see reverence and fear that we owe to God. You are awesome. Not because of anything you have done, but because of who you are and who you were created by. Everything that surrounds us from the bread loaf that we take from in the morning to have our breakfast to the stars in the sky, everything is full of that same reverence and awe pointing to God. And yet, we lose it, don't we? 
We walk around <laughs> kicking the tires of our farm equipment saying, ah, piece of junk, when it breaks down. Not remembering the thousands of years of God's provision of brains in the human skull that went into the invention of such a thing. When our dog pees or poops where it's not supposed to, bad dog, which is true. But that dog is incredible. See, this is what Paul's talking about. And this can help us get rid of our other fear. If we can recapture, if we can capture that childhood sense of awe and wonder, and if we can, we can live in that place where we walk along in this earth with reverence and awe, working out our salvation with fear and trembling, then why, why would we be afraid of <clears throat> whatever somebody could do of me because do to me because I am so in awe of the God who made and sustains it all. It's all nothing compared to Him. Even the greatest construction that could ever be, if someone was actually able to make a Dyson sphere, it would be nothing to the God who flung the stars themselves into space and who knows them all. Brothers and sisters, we, we need to purposefully choose to live in awe and reverence. Right? When you are here in this building, you can see this building that you have seen probably hundreds of times before. Or you can see God's faithfulness in many, many generations of Christ followers. You can see not only our congregation, but your parents and your grandparents and perhaps your great-grandparents and beyond who were followers of Jesus back in the Netherlands or wherever they came from. You can see not only our congregation, but you can also see the churches that were residing here in this place before us. You can see the history of countless followers of Jesus who came into this place and who did what they could to follow him. You can see the, the beauty of the, the wood that was provided to build this. If you, go, if you go downstairs and you look in the little closet that's underneath the, the stairs over there, you can see the beams that were used for the original construction. Or if you go up into the bell tower, not that I'm encouraging you to do that for insurance reasons, but if you go into the bell tower, you can see the bones of the church built. And that bell that was hoisted up there a couple hundred years ago, Hundred, I don't know, however many, long time ago, right? You can see the, the, the incredible reality of God helping people to create music. And all the complexity of a, a piano. Or, weirdly enough, the even greater complexity of that little synthesizer keyboard thing. You can see the, the uniqueness 
and the beauty in each other's faces and bodies and hearts. This is a world of awe and wonder that points to a God of awe and wonder beyond anything we can imagine. This, brothers and sisters, is the only fear worth having. The fear of God. A reverence and awe of Him and all that He has done and is doing and will do. This is the only fear worth having. And if we... If we live in this fear, this awe, this reverence, if we live and we cultivate that reality each and every day, we can foster our sense of gratitude. Lord God, thank you for this microphone stand. Lord God, thank you for this pew or this this stage. Thank you so much for my friends. Thank you so much for my enemies. Thank you so much for the curtains and the windows and the clouds and the trees and the air and the and the cement and thank you so much for all of these things. Re- remember, I don't know if you remember, but one of my favorite movies of all time is It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart, right? You, many of you know that movie. If you don't know that movie, watch the movie. It's got some bad theology, but it's got some really good theology too in some ways. Anyways, Jimmy Stewart's character, he gets the opportunity to find out what the world would be like if he had never been born because he reaches this place of, of desperation and he thinks that it would be better if he'd never been born. And, and he realizes realizes through that, of course, uh, sorry to spoil things a little bit, he realizes through that, of course, that the reality is that things would not have been better if he had not been born. But for our purposes, the important thing is that he comes back into the real world after having experienced this vision in which he lived for a while, and he is so so grateful and so in awe of everything he sees. He comes into his house and he's running up and down the stairs to look for his kids and his family and he's so excited. And and the the little round knob at the top of the newel post at the bottom of the stairs, he used used to drive him nuts that that thing would come off in his hand every time he came up and down the stairs. And he comes down and he pulls that little knob off again and he, he laughs, he's going, ha ha, and he gives it a kiss. Because the mundane and the boring and the annoying has suddenly turned beautiful and awesome. Brothers and sisters, today, this week, this month, this year, for the rest of our lives, let us cultivate awe and wonder. Let us do as Paul suggests or as Paul commands and work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Because, why? Because it is God, that same God who created and sustains all these things, it is God who works in you to will and to act according to His good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing, right? Instead of, stupid noodle post. It's like, ha, ha, ha. Do everything without arguing or complaining so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the heavens. As you hold out the word of life. Brothers and sisters. God has given us. A peep. Through the curtain. At the bones of the universe. 
And the bones of the universe were created by God. The God who is love and the God who lives with us. Let us never lose sight of that fear. Let's pray. Father in heaven, help us to recover the awe and wonder that we have experienced from time to time in our lives. And help us to move beyond even that into a greater and greater awareness of who you truly are and of what you have done and are doing and will do. May we see truly and may we work out our salvation in fear and trembling. In so doing, O God, help us so that we may no longer fear the things that can really ultimately do us no harm. So that we may say that even if our lives are taken, or if we are poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice, that we may say, even so, we are glad. And we rejoice, for we are yours. <clears throat> oh God, help us to carry that awe and wonder everywhere we go, that we may shine like stars in the universe and spread your good purpose in this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.